<laughs> to say, I'm Chris Cooley. I'm a proud supporter of Rock Growth, local entrepreneur, and uh, welcome today to this March 15th noon edition of Rock Growth Candids. And uh, we will be having some PSAs in the middle of this session today. Those are public service announcements from community leaders who uh, have a great message for you and, and potentially an ask. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my good friend, Richard Glazer. And uh, Richard will lead us in a, in a moderated discussion here today. And uh, Richard, please start with the mission and take it away, my friend. Yeah, well, I'll start with recognizing today is Ides of March. Tomorrow is the second anniversary of the lockdown that went into place two years ago. And when we pivoted to virtual uh, formats for rock growth and Thursday, St. Patty's Day. So I don't know, maybe it's an auspicious week, but um, I'm also noting the color behind me is Ukrainian blue. And, um, you know, I was reflecting this morning on the magnitude of, this, this, of the situation and how the world just feels a little out of kilter. And I, I wanna pause, just this is the pause. I don't need a moment of silence, but to extend our prayers and our thoughts to the people who are being challenged with the gross inhumanities in Eastern Europe. And on that score, we as people are capable of so many horrible things, but also we are also capable of wonderful, humane acts of kindness. And it's a delight to future Simeon Bannister who's dedicated his life to that. And um, Again, it's also a pleasure to feature him and his work because it aligns with the mission of Rock Growth, which includes empowering the new Rochester. Um, and I would believe, I believe Simeon is, falls into that category, the new generation, the emerging and um, optimism ahead of us in our community. We also like to feature leading innovators and entrepreneurs, and he also falls into that category. Um, and it's a little difficult right now in the Zoom format, we do have a chat, but we'd like to instigate creative collisions. So trying to get people to know each other who don't, but should, and go off and good, do good trouble. And finally, everything we do is informed by promoting greater equality of race, class, gender, and age. So Simeon, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. the opportunity to be with you. Yeah, I consider you a friend. So I know a little bit more about you than most, but this is a time when I like to ask our guests a little bit to share a little bit about their origin story. Sure. Um, I know you're a product of Rochester. Why don't, why don't you share with the community? Well, again, thanks, Richard, for uh, for having me on. And it's funny because I'm looking across the various screens here. And when you ask about my origin story, at least part of it is on the screen. Um, it's folks that are part of this community that certainly contributed uh, to my upbringing, uh, both uh, here and then my return to Rochester. Um, and it really is uh, the story of a bit of an amalgamation. I'll tell you a couple of, of highlights, though. Uh, so I am Rochester through and through. Uh, I was born and raised here in Rochester. My dad was born and raised here in Rochester. My grandfather actually came here uh, in 1946 uh, after uh, his uh, honorable discharge uh, from military service in the army. Uh, moved up here to Rochester looking for some opportunities and actually did some work with, um, was a labor foreman uh, with, uh, with Pike uh, Construction. And uh, the work that uh, he did really created some um, opportunity uh, for my uh, dad, uh, and particularly in, in, uh, in, in his family. Um, we had a very fascinating story here in Rochester because when my grandfather moved here, he and my grandmother had a duplex uh, that was on uh, Tremont Street. And that duplex, they lived in half of it. And everybody from Culpeper, Virginia, where uh, he was born, uh, would come spend a little time in the duplex and then move out into Rochester. And so there's an important story and I see a lot of friends on the call. I saw uh, my friend uh, Shane uh, Wiegand down here who's been talking in the community through the Anti-Racist Curriculum Project about kind of this history of Rochester. That's my own uh, history. Um, fast forward a little bit. Uh, I was born um, an 80s kid 
and uh, and all that that means. <laughs> and so I uh, came up here in Rochester. Richard, a big part of my story is a sense of agency um, and optimism that things can change. And that was uh, in part fostered when I was about nine years old, uh, eight or nine years old, I was walking with my mother downtown. Um, and folks might remember when Sibley's wasn't just an economic development project, but it was an actual store. And uh, at the time we were walking down downtown and I looked up at the, um, the windows, it's around Christmas, and I remarked to my mother that none of the uh, mannequins that were in the window looked like us, um, that they did not you know, reflect uh, our skin tone. And uh, if you know my mom, who is very active here in Rochester, I know some of you do, uh, in classic Irish Bannister form, we went home and she made me write a letter. And the letter was to Sibley's uh, and to the Democrat and Chronicle uh, explaining what I saw. She wrote the letter, but you know, I wrote the letter, right? And at any rate, so we sent the letter in and about uh, two and a half, three weeks later, uh, my mom uh, picked me up uh, from school and we went back downtown. And all of a sudden there were caramel colored mannequins and chocolate colored mannequins. Uh, and a representation of the mosaic of this community. And my mom said to me that I had contributed to making that change, a deep sense of agency that things can improve and things can be better. And so that's you know who I come from in a big part of my life, whether it was here in Rochester, uh, traveling um, down to Carolina to get my undergraduate degree, moving to Princeton uh, and New Jersey to uh, get a grad degree, living in New York City, working in politics and government and whatnot, and uh, ultimately moving back here to Rochester and pursuing some opportunities in philanthropy to really strengthen our community. It is fundamentally grounded in the belief that things can get better. You have a very eclectic background. So I, you know, Princeton, you, you obtained a divinity degree, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, with dealing with my own existential questions, <laughs> at least in some part. Uh, I, uh, I went to Princeton um, Divinity School. I had, uh, the, the short story behind that is when I was an undergrad, um, I was actually planning on going to law school, to be perfectly honest. And um, a friend of mine was doing a clothing drop off. And so we had gone by his uh, church, it was a Presbyterian church in Durham, North Carolina. And while we were there dropping off these clothes, I started chatting with the pastor. And so the pastor uh, of this church says to me, you know, you know he's like a bright guy, you know, um, and I'd love to introduce you to a few people. Well, lo and behold, we go to this uh, meeting and the meeting is at the top of the tallest building in Durham. So you ride the elevator up, you get off the elevator, you walk into this boardroom, long table, very intimidating. And uh, these folks started asking me all these questions where it turned out that it was a group that was called the March 5th group. And they were really interested, kind of a lot of uh, leading folks in Carolina that were Presbyterian and Princeton is, is very closely associated with the Presbyterian church. They were interested in trying to restock the, uh, the, the Presbytery and the ministry. And, uh, and so uh, they said, you should go to seminary. And I said, okay, well, you know what? I'm gonna go for a year and see what it's like. And check it out and then we'll go from there and they said you can go three years which is the typical term or you can go 10 minutes it's up to you no strings attached and uh while i was there i got this wonderful education that was in part seminary but also um it was very philosophical um and i had a chance to study with folks like cornell west and uh, eddie glaude who is on tv all the time now which is hilarious um and others so you're around some of the great african-american intellectuals I did. I actually took a class that was called um, uh, African American Intellectuals 20th Century. And if I tell you this class was like crazy, um, some of the folks that came to visit, at one point, uh, Jay Z was in class. Uh, and he definitely showed up not as like Jay Z, the, you know, uh, rapper, but he showed up as Sean Carter, like the guy who was also intimidated to be in this class with people asking him some really penetrating questions about his uh, artistry. But uh, really, really shaped, a, was a big part of my experiences and, and made a lot of really wonderful relationships there too. So there were a number of steps along the way. You were in the private sector. You, you spent some time in government agencies before you arrived at the Community Foundation. So again, yeah. being a, a, an eclectic background. Yeah, yeah it's kind of funny because you, you start putting these little, um, you know, arrows in your quiver or tools in your tool belt, choose your metaphor. 
uh, along the way. And as you're doing that, you, necessarily, you don't necessarily know how they're gonna play out in the future. Uh, give you an example. Uh, one position that I held uh, for the public advocate uh, down in the city of New York, who is the uh, kind of counterpoint in government, so kind of the ombuds person for um, for New York City government, um, that role also had a seat on the uh, New York City Employee Retirement System, NICERS. And one of the uh, responsibilities there was to identify managers um, that would um, handle the investments for the New York City Employee Retirement System's uh, pensions. Well. That was a great experience, met a lot of cool folks, but who knew that, you know, 20 years later, uh, I would be uh, coming to the uh, Community Foundation where, lo and behold, one of the key functions that we have is to smartly invest um, the uh, endowment uh, that we hold on behalf of this community uh, and to make sure that those returns are used to improve and strengthen the community. And I've got a ton of stories like this. We've only got an hour today, but well, I've got Simeon, a ton of whenever stories. we get together, we go way beyond what we <laughs> But I, I want to use the word invest in an investment. And that that's a good opportunity to shift the conversation to the community foundation in mm -hmm. your vision. I, I first want to know Jen, you know, Jennifer Leonard, I consider her and her husband a friend, and the recognize the accomplishments the foundation has achieved under her stewardship um, and I also want to shout shout out to her for her um, perspicacity in you know in supporting you in in your future role as CEO and president I believe you take the helm in October yeah. so the community foundation people know it's a source of funding it's a charitable institution for donors it's a way to get a tax write-off it's a lot more than that, but can you sort of open up the hood and, and share a little bit about what the Community Foundation is? Yeah, yeah. Well, first, I got to start uh, just with, you know, um, a, a word of gratitude for the work that Jennifer has done, uh, both for me personally and for our community, broadly speaking. Um, I want you to consider that the Community Foundation has grown 20 times over um, since uh, Jennifer took the helm. Our endowment, when she started was about $40 million or so. And we have now crested uh, over uh, $600 million. I mean, that is just a testament to her perspicacity in terms of her relationship with me, but then also the, 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 um, the intellect and the skills and the talent and the relationship building um, and the vision, frankly, for what the Community Foundation could be and ultimately what it has um, grown uh, to become. And so I just, you know, I, I have to start with that, with that note of gratitude. I think beyond that, uh, the Community Foundation really is a fascinating um, organization. And the reason why it's a fascinating organization is because we typically talk about it as the Community Foundation, but the Community Foundation is a lot of things uh, kind of under an umbrella. Um, the Community Foundation is uh, a vehicle through which um, folks that are philanthropically oriented in our community uh, can enjoy uh, joyful and easy philanthropic experiences. Um, we are a place to share information and knowledge about how community partners can collaborate and work together to improve Rochester. Uh, we are a place to share information, data, analysis, and we've done that uh, through ACT Rochester. We're a place that if folks believe in the work of the Community Foundation and the staff that, uh, that we have, that folks can provide unrestricted gifts that say, you know what, you guys are in the trenches, you're talking to folks, you're engaging with folks, and I trust that you have the ability uh, over generations um, to, uh, to invest these dollars. I think one of the things that's a niche characteristic for the Community Foundation, one of the real unique assets that we bring, frankly, is the endowment. And that endowment equips us to do uh, a few things. We're kind of afforded a few luxuries. The first is that endowment gives you the gift of time, right? Uh, I had never worked in an organization before with the scope and length of time that the Community Foundation has. We, I work in a place where we talk about forever funds. You imagine that? Um, funds that as long as there's a market, as long as there's a community, we will be here forever. It's the design of the Community Foundation. Uh, and with those um, funds and with that endowment, with that long-term vision, we have an obligation then to be, in some sense, stewards of the future, to peer around the curve, to see some of the issues that we may not be talking about today, but we need to prep for. Things like, for example, 
the work we need to do in environmental justice and sustainability here in Rochester. Uh, we are afforded, um, in some sense, a reputation because we're not often um, showing up with, re you know, looking for our dollars. Um, in fact, we launched, and we'll talk about this momentarily, the North Star Coalition. And at the coalition, uh, our new mayor, uh, Malik Evans, said that one of the things that he really appreciated about the Community Foundation, and he's been on our board and been associated with the Community Foundation for a long time, he said, I love that you guys are doing this because I know that you're not coming here just to try to get money out of the stimulus uh, in that case. And that's absolutely the case. It's absolutely true. Um, and so this reputation that we have for being an unbiased um, party allows us to really be a trusted voice, to be a convener, and to be a translator, right? And that translation function is critical. Uh, I was talking with um, uh, my friend uh, Matt uh, Hurlbut over at Greater Rochester Enterprise uh, not too long ago. And one of the things that we were kind of you know, uh, chuckling about, frankly, is that and there are mornings where I will go to GRE and Matt will talk about what site selector uh, preferences are. Uh, he'll talk about, you know, how site selectors are looking for a strong urban workforce. You know, we need a strong urban core. Uh, and then I'll leave there and head to, say, a Mark View Heights community meeting where folks are saying, we need jobs. We need opportunity. Guess what? We are saying the same thing. And the question is, how do we create the right linkages to bring that to fruition. Um, and so I think we're really excited about that. The endowment really is an important asset for us and it's an important asset for the broader community that allows us to play a really important function. I think you went on mute, Richard. Thanks for highlighting that. My, my dog was barking at the uh, Amazon delivery guy, so. <laughs> yeah, no worries, I appreciate that. <laughs> the way <it laughs> Zoom. So, um, I consider you a student of history, and um, so am I, an amateur. Um, I don't think I can, can go teach at one of the universities, but it's fascinating. And I, I wanna bring up um, the work you've done in the research, and I, I am pleased to see Shane uh, here, and uh, I saw him say hello to you, gave you a regards on, in, in the chat because of the work both of you have done to highlight. And I, I want to sort of probe, we're not here to deliver a history lesson, but we can touch upon some elements, um, how that informs the work you're doing now and the work you, where the direction you want to steer the ship when you take over the helm. Okay. So I think what we have to appreciate, and, and history does uh, such a tremendous job of this, is that we've got to see the through lines, we've got to see the connections, We've got to be able to um, navigate ourselves between the macro, right, kind of what is happening broadly in context, and the micro, what we're working on on a day-to-day -day basis, and make much stronger connections, right? There's some fascinating things, certainly the, for example, today, the geopolitical environment, you mentioned Ukraine at the outset, uh, might feel like it's a half world away, but the implications um, for such a seismic event are very real, and of course, we're, many of us are feeling that. Uh, in Rochester today. So that's a big part of why I tend to think a lot about history um, for examples. Um, I think that there are a lot of breadcrumbs in history that lead us to some of the answers that we might um, discover today. I think in Rochester's history, um, the you know kind of framing here, at least from my perspective, is that uh, economic disparity, right, has been a prerequisite in a lot of ways for economic decline. And uh, we won't do a history lesson today, Richard, but I've got a lot of evidence to demonstrate that this is the case, right? That when you have too much homogeneity um, and leadership roles, um, that when you uh, don't have the kind of cauldron of ideation that you get when you have a diverse and inclusive community, that what you get is stayed um, and it misses important um, uh, moments, like for example, the digital revolution, right? Uh, and so that economic disparity as a prerequisite for economic decline suggests to me then uh, that there is an economic opportunity for economic growth that's a function of economic parity or economic equity. Um, there's a fascinating study that just came out from the Brookings uh, Institute a couple of months back. Uh, and it was, it was titled The Economic Gains from Economic Equity. And what they basically uh, argue in this study uh, is that if you, and this makes a lot of sense if you think about it, uh, if you think about talent, right, and I hope everybody on this call believes this, that talent is equitably distributed. 
Talent doesn't know race. It doesn't know neighborhood. It doesn't know, right? Talent is talent. It just is what it is, right? And so if we don't maximize the talent, particularly in communities where that have been neglected, that represents economic loss. And again, our history bears this out. Uh, and so if we really want to make gains as a community, if we want to see uh, economic growth, then we've got to be able to maximize all of the talent. We've got to allow folks to achieve their fullest human potential, or at least have the chance to do so. And we know that because of redlining and restrictive covenants, um, a whole lot of policy decisions, that that's created this very calcified structure in our community that we have to dismantle if we want to unlock economic growth. There are some people that say, hey, I'm doing okay. Feels great to me. Rochester's working out. And I would argue to those people that it could be so much better. And I know that that's trying to prove a counterfactual in some sense. Um, but the fact is that there is a real path forward for us. And I think that's what we want to certainly champion. And uh, the Community Foundation, we want to partner with others, um, that we've got to see the connections here, Richard, right? We've got to see the connections. We can't get so myopic in the things that we're doing and the work that we have going that we can't see the connections that we make with others to bring about uh, a future for our community that's much more prosperous. I often respond to people who might be, you know, accustomed to the way it is and ask them, where do their kids want to live? Yeah. If they're at that point of that juncture in their life after college or whatever, and you see what communities are, are draw for top talent. And, and I just want to highlight um, uh, next week, the Community Design Center is featuring Andre Perry of the Brookings Institute, who is probably one of the co-authors, if not of that report. Others like it. He does research into um, you know, urban um, the, the field of urban studies and discrimination. So, um, just Richard, if you don't mind, just about uh, Andre Perry. Um, I, his his work caught my eye in particular because I used to do some work when I first 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 came back to Rochester as a, a commercial real estate appraiser. And one of the things that was really mind boggling to me is that um, if you do uh, a new roof, for example. Uh, say on Jefferson Avenue, right? Uh, and you do that same roof on Jefferson Road, right? Uh, it's going to cost you 12 grand regardless, right? Depending on size of the house. Uh, the roof costs the same, but the contributory value of that roof, right? Um, in the city, it's about 63% on the value of the roof. In Pittsburgh, 109%, right? And so even though we're talking the same materials, the same amount of labor, there is a predisposition in the valuation of those homes. That's so much what uh, Andre's uh, work is about. That valuation, that, that difference um, is some of the margin that we see in terms of the outcomes for folks in our community. And that's ridiculous, right? And it's actually, um, again, I, I will resist the temptation to go off into the weeds, uh, but there's a model within the appraisal field that really does um, uh, depend on the notion that people want to be close to where the action is, where they work, they want to spend dollars where they work. And what we've seen in Rochester is that structural racism historically has run counter to that model, right? It doesn't actually make a lot of economic sense to live like, you know, a bazillion miles away from where the action is. Uh, and so the model actually got turned on its head and uh, business started to chase um, folks, uh, the residents that were moving out of the city the prerequisite for a lot of that was 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 fear, and that's unfortunate. But again, you know, we don't have to get stuck in the past. We can do something about it. And the real opportunity is to be aware of the past, to acknowledge it, and then to point our direction forward. And work from data as opposed to emotions or perhaps what was fed to us as the history. So um, this is a moment where I want to shift to the North Star Coalition. Um, we were early supporters, Rock Growth and myself. I just find the name so appealing since it's a recognition of one of the greatest Americans who happened to call Rochester home much of his adult life. And now the airport is renamed after him. Um, and if we can find Paul, Paul Hippolyte, of leading with our values, uh, former Rochester resident who remains linked to the community through Simeon and in the work we're about to discuss. So if we can get Paul on the screen, that would be great. 
But before then, maybe Simeon, I, I'll want to introduce Paul. If let's see, maybe I know he was here earlier. He's I'm, here. I'm, I'm here. Pinned. Yeah, I'm here. hear you. I just got to get him oh, pinned. There he is. Now he's pinned. <laughs> That's great. Good. Hi, Paul. We miss you up here. <laughs> Thank so you. Da- are you, you're you're somewhere in in New York City at the moment, correct? Yes. Yes. So, so tell us about leading with our values. Yeah, so um, I started it in 2020. Um, It's a public affairs company um, committed to racial, economic, gender, and environmental justice. Um, The idea being that most of the companies that do work in this this space um, are typically um, connected to one side of the aisle or the other, um, which doesn't say a lot about their uh, moral underpinnings and more just says to to which party or or uh, groups of people that they generally work with. Uh, and during my journey working in the political field, um, I, I just came across a lot of people that I, th- I thought were doing good work in this in this space, but um, were working with companies uh, that were not that often did not have the overall community's interest at heart. Um, and I wanted to have a company that was upfront about that and, and was very clear with not only um, potential clients, but with the public that that's the kind of work that we were trying to do. Um, and so we've been, uh, we've been in business since, um, since October of 2020 and, and really fortunate to be able to, to collaborate with um, the Community Foundation and with Simeon um, on this work with the North Star Coalition that we're going to talk about now. So thank you. Well, obviously, the senator and our congressman uh, made announcements yesterday. Uh, the prior week, it just seems like money keeps raining on Rochester, and that's due to all the COVID largesse the government is sharing with us, and it filters down. So please explain the genesis of the North Star Coalition and and its purpose. Yeah, we'll pop a, uh, a link in the uh, in the chat. Uh, I know one of my colleagues is, uh, was just messaging me to say, pop, a, pop a links in the chat. And I cannot do both, I will confess that. So, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but you'll see, start to see some of that populate. In the, in the meantime, uh, we mentioned the, the, uh, the historic uh, reference points. Uh, if we look back at the New Deal, um, uh, that was uh, obviously a fairly significant uh, point in American history. I want you to take a second to imagine um, what America looked like kind of, you know, pre-1930, right? Um, Certainly there was, there was rapid income disparity. That was a defining feature actually of the roaring twenties. But there was also, uh, we were still in many ways an agrarian economy. We're starting to embrace um, becoming uh, an industrial economy. Um, Education looked completely different, right? Instead of what we now recognize today as education, um, Education America in those days were primarily kind of one room um, uh, schoolhouses, uh, some of the um, differentiation in terms of grades, right, that didn't really uh, show up in, in, uh, in, in schooling by and large across the country. So this is a huge moment where the influx of resources at the same time as the economy starts to change in the country, this transition to an industrial economy has profound ramifications for ultimately um, what we now know today, the echo effects of many decisions. We mentioned redlining earlier, the creation of the um, Homeowners Loan Corporation, um, the um, uh, Civilian Corps, uh, the Works Progress Administration. Um, These were all huge um, distributions of dollars, again, that had outsized impacts. Fast forward um, to the moment that we're in now. Transition in the economy as we fully embrace an ideation and knowledge-based economy as we are transitioning away from a primarily industrial economy. Education certainly needs to change because it doesn't feel like the systems that we have in place um, are the right fit for the moment that we're in. It feels like maybe they're a bit outmoded. Um, We have some significant challenges that we need to take into account in terms of how we think about knowledge production and knowledge distribution and accessibility um, to that space. We know that in the New Deal, a primary characteristic was racial exclusion. 
uh, I won't do it today, but if you ever reach out to me, I found a pamphlet. My uh, um, grandfather, I talked about my dad's side of the family, but my, my mom's side of the family, uh, my uh, great, great grandfather was a very prolific um, uh, educator and politician um, out in Oklahoma, was a Sooner actually in Oklahoma. And amongst his things, I found a pamphlet um, that uh, uh, described a thousand reasons why the title of this piece was a thousand reasons why Negroes should vote for Roosevelt. And it listed out accomplishments of the uh, of the New Deal, and when you read it, it's I mean, it obviously because of historical context reads in a way that's like clanging symbols uh, in your ear, um, but the embedded exclusionary practices uh, that were there. We needed to build new housing that was cl uh, clean to take care of the fetid conditions in um, in, in uh, squalor of of uh, black communities, Negro communities, as the piece said. Um, wow, that turned into the, the projects that we know today. And we all know the conditions in many of those developments. So again, what we wanna do is learn from the past. Perhaps if we can lean into innovation, if we can lean into some of these changes, but let's not do the thing that we did before in terms of racial exclusion. Let's make sure that this is an inclusive, that this is an equitable recovery. And the premise there is that in so doing, we can unlock economic growth. We can unlock opportunity. We can unlock the potential for a regenerative economy. These, you know, it shouldn't be lost on anybody that a lot of these conversations that are happening nationally are happening in parallel with one another, right? That at the same time we're having this, this awakening around concerns around racial equity, we're also having a conversation around environmental justice and environmental sustainability. It's because these things are linked. Again, take the macro picture, Let's connect it to the micro work that we can do. So that's the basis for the coalition. The coalition basically says, here's a list of resources, Brookings Institute, um, uh, the Urban Institute, um, uh, CGR has joined us, the Children's Agenda has been a part of the work and a number of others uh, that are intellectual resources for everyone to draw on. As long as you believe in the North Star, which says that we wanna get these dollars into the hands of people that have been on the economic margins because it's through those folks that we create economic growth. Uh, and so um, we've made those resources available uh, and it's been some fairly disparate groups that have reached out. We've been working with everybody from the Hinge Neighbors uh, to um, the uh, City Roots Land Trust to I mean, just the Paul can, can, can account for the myriad of, uh, of organizations that we've been uh, engaging with. Um, and we're providing data information analysis so that we can make sure that we maximize these dollars and that we treat them as an asset. Last thing I'll say, Richard, on this is um, if we think back to the ARRA, that was the Obama stimulus, I was actually working in state government at that time. And I recall being up at like two o'clock in the morning trying to figure out what a what a uh, ARR, what a, what a uh, shovel ready project was. Everybody recall that language, shovel ready projects. And like nobody around the country like really knew what the criteria were for these shovel ready projects. I read a study that of that nearly trillion dollar piece of legislation that the country really only experienced about $300 billion worth of actual economic benefit because so much of the money was clawed back by the federal government because people didn't use it. Let's not do that. <laughs> you know, let's make sure that we get as much of the resource that we can, but then let's deploy it in the smartest ways possible. That's really what the coalition uh, is all so let, about. So let's let's talk about you know putting the pedal to the metal, or <laughs> or actually, I'm going to use a different auto metaphor: the rubber meets the road. Um, dwelling in the world of entrepreneurship and innovation business, sometimes the the government seems far removed and abstract. And and what are the tactics you're deploying to? create the right connections, provide the right education and information, and actually um, fulfilling the goals of bringing this money in to our community and, and doing it in a enlightened way. Yeah, so, you know, some of the armchair uh, psychologists in the room may have read the book Nudge and some other uh, pieces that really, you know, cause us to think about uh, human behavior. Uh, one thing I know about human behavior, and I think uh, Paul and I, when we first started uh, putting our heads together on what this could look like, and I should uh, note that this went through a bunch of different changes and iterations. Um, we worked with a number of our colleagues in the philanthropic sector coming out of the community crisis fund, right? Trying to figure out what can we do next? Um, and so we went through a number of iterations. One thing that we know about human behavior is that people do not like being told what to do. 
Uh, and so if we approach this with finger wagging and, you know, this is what needs to happen and, you know, we know the answer, um, that was certainly not going to be received. And oh, by the way, we don't quote know the answer. What we can do is get on a journey together um, so that we can learn together. Uh, and I think that's what, you know, we're, we've tried to offer here is not issuing polemics, but bringing people together around some shared information, some shared facts. Uh, let's leverage what people are learning all across the country. Uh, we were just in a conversation, Paul and I, with folks out of Memphis uh, and out of Chicago. Uh, here's something interesting. Memphis has already distributed the lion's share of their stimulus dollars. That interest, like how, why, right? Uh, there's some things that we're learning about whether their process was equitable or not. Um, part of, you know, they've made a trade-off of maybe some equity for efficiency just to get the dollars out the door. There were some impositions that were made on that community by uh, Tennessee state government. But the point is that there's some fascinating things that are happening around the country and we want to leverage them. We also have really smart people in our community. I'm seeing uh, on my screen right now, somebody like Jean Deprez, who uh, has done work all across the globe and that we might want to leverage. Um, and the folks at CDC, I see Melissa Marquez on my screen. I'm just picking up the people I'm seeing on the screen right now, right? And so we've got a broad coalition of folks. We need to leverage the knowledge, the experience, the talent, um, so that we can really um, leverage these dollars as far as we can, Richard. Um, and so that's what we're doing is creating the right convenings, bringing folks together. Um, and just if you want to get into the, into the tactical details, it really is just folks sit down with Urban, with Brookings, whomever. We do some scoping meetings to figure out what the interests are, uh, and then we set them to work. Um, we try to keep the material short so nobody's you know, dropping 50 page research papers that no one's going to read. Uh, we're trying to keep these things to you know a page or two or three so that they're consumable and useful. And, uh, and then in so doing, uh, that gives us a chance um, to really see the work happen and not just kind of like talk and talk and talk um, because that nobody uh, needs that at this point. Uh, actually, one, one, one final piece uh, is making sure the community itself is deeply engaged. And I'll call out one other uh, colleague I'm seeing on the screen, Takia Butler, who's been uh, talking with us about how can we get this work in deeply embedded into the community in ways that are not just kind of lip service, right? And not just on the way to doing what we want to do. Hey, can you give us a, you know, your opinion? But really figuring out ways that folks in the community itself can drive the action. Um, and that's certainly um, uh, an opportunity for us, I think, as, uh, as, as a community. I, I want to break for the um, announcements in a moment, but my understanding is the Community Foundation is committed to it with various resources, including money for the long haul. This isn't just a one quarter initiative. This is meant to continue for the foreseeable future, right? That's right. And I've got to give a tip of the cap to our board um, and uh, Tom Richards, former mayor, chairs our board. Uh, our board at the start of this said, you know what? Bit, the inclusive recovery and an equitable recovery is the big issue focus for the community foundation. Uh, and so uh, we said that certainly for the next 18 months, we're about six months into that, that that was going to be a primary focus uh, for our work, not just by ourselves, though. And that's, this, is, this is important. Um, our board, through a, our last strategic plan, uh, really lifted up this idea that we wanted to engage in catalytic community impact. And so it really is, you know, if you're so out in front that you look back and you don't have anybody behind you, you've done it, you've done it wrong. And uh, so that's why the coalition was really an important dimension here bringing people together in philanthropy and government and the private sector and bringing business to, to the table so that we actually can um, uh, achieve a, a, a strong and robust recovery. Okay, let's pick up um, after in about eight or so minutes. Please, everyone stick around. There are some interesting individuals that are featuring. Um, and maybe we'll talk more about how we can help and get engaged with this effort as well. So first, um, I know he's he may have some limited time. I hopefully Kayvon Travis of Food Concepts is still with us. I know he joined the call from Atlanta. Isn't that the yeah? Video? I'm here, Kayvon. Um, I'm here. All right, let's let's see if Tom can get you spotlighted. Trying to find him. Trying yeah, to find right him. Get, I must. <laughs> we have seventy five individuals today. This is really great. So we got Kayvon. All right. Hey, perfect. Can, you, can you hear me, Tom? We can hear you. Perfect, mm -hmm. perfect. Well, first thing I want to start by saying thank you, uh, Simon and Paul, for 
what you guys are offering. Uh, definitely informative. Um, so as Richard said, my name is Kayvon Chapman. I'm one of the partners at Food Concepts and what I focus on is biz dev. Um, but what we, what we do is we have pivoted over to becoming a multicultural marketing agency. So what that means essentially is brands usually come to us first things first because we are a fully black owned marketing agency. But secondly, so we can help them curate a message that resonates with the minority audiences. So that may look like us working with working building out digital campaigns, web web development, uh, social media campaigns that essentially just resonates with the minority audiences because they do they have a hard time reaching these demographics. So that's essentially what we do and what we have pivoted over to. That's great. Kayvon, can you put your contact info in the chat? Yeah, um, we'll do. I recently became familiar with Food Concepts through your partner, Latrell, who lives in Rochester. And I know, Kayvon, you split your time between the two. I find, I find our conversations have been very interesting and that you are definitely part of the new Rochester. So mm -hmm. <laughs> thus, this opportunity. Um, moving along, um, Matt Droon of Oak Grove Companies, um, a friend and all, is Matt, are, take yourself off and mute if you don't mind so we can hear if you're still present. Yes, I am. All right. Whoa, nice building. <laughs> I think that's oh. the wild. Is that the wilder or no, no, that's oh. Canal Street. Well, anyway, yeah. here's, your, here's your minute. Go ahead. All right, sounds good. Um, yeah, my name is Matt Drone with Oak Grove Development. Um, we are a real estate development company that specializes in uh, historic adaptive reuse projects with a focus we've heavily invested in the Susan B. Anthony neighborhood. Um, and not a lot of people that live in Rochester and have lived in Rochester their entire lives even know where the Susan B. Anthony neighborhood is. Um, I've had an office over on King Street for about a few years. And when I say that I'm located in Susan B. Anthony, I said, are you, oh, you're located over by Mount Hope. And I say, no, that's where she's buried, fool. <laughs> um, so, uh, so this is our latest project on 53 Canal Street. Um, we've been, uh, it's a historic building uh, that is actually a former chewing gum factory. And so we've been having um, uh, monthly events called the Market on Canal to draw people into the neighborhood and experience the neighborhood um, and also offer a uh, low barrier of, uh, uh, entry for uh, small business owners and entrepreneurs and artisans to showcase uh, their works and we take their uh, their booth rentals essentially and pay a artist to come in to do a live uh, mini mural painting as well as a mu musical artist uh, so it's definitely very multi uh, multi-sensory um, and our objective behind that is uh, is to you know get the buzz going about uh, the neighborhood and also the building um, we have a, a tenant on the first floor that we secured space uh, for it's a commercial uh, bakery and we're looking for uh, tenants to take the second and third floor of the building um, and really looking to build a, on a, a Bauhaus concept. Um, a lot of developers will take large spaces and cut them up into little tiny spaces. And then you have these long corridors and you know, cre you know creepy corridors and stuff like that. And with this, we wanna be able to keep spaces wide open as possible to really encourage collaboration with people that might be interested, you know, in the same type of discipline. So um, Richard, if you don't mind, I just have like a little 30 yeah. second, 30 second video. Um, no, 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 no. You could share a link, but are you, you we, we need to move on, but I want to, you, you, anyone who's connected with neighborhood building and in, in Rochester needs to know you. This is someone who's doing it as an entrepreneur with his own cap risk capital and maybe we can help create greater collaboration and interfaces between the public sector and people like you. So good. thanks Richard. All right, um, I'm just going down my list. There's no logic to how, how I'm choosing you in what order. Uh, Brandon, Brandon Voulage. Hey Richard, thanks for having us. Go for it. You got your I, I am one of the founders of Curate, uh, along with Chris Lindstrom, who's also in this chat. And he's actually gonna give you guys a bit of an overview of uh, what we're about. Uh, Chris? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, so we pivoted from our prior startup at the start of 2021, which we didn't feel was viable in a post-pandemic world. Um, so now Curate holds bi-weekly events that features a meal from a small locally owned restaurant that feeds two people. 
each meal is a surprise to our customers until they pick it up from our central location at the historic German house in the South Wedge with our pick up partner, Chris Brocky. We try to work with local people to help us grow and get us different footholds in the community. Um, we've held over 25 events with a focus on minority owned businesses. And we continue to grow through dedicated customers, um, media outreach from uh, Tiana Magnon. I don't know if everybody knows her. She has a great uh, service called Magnon Media, uh, helping people get exposure to the community. And uh, Secretary Corshane, who leads their social media efforts. Um, basically, our value proposition is our customers get to experience the wide variety of restaurants that Rochester has to offer with low effort on their part and no preconceived notions on what that cuisine might mean to them or their experience of it so far. Um, we provide background on the restaurant at Pickup. I have uh, experience doing restaurant reviews and podcasting. I'm going to, I, I need we, um, really, I need, I'm really watching the clock. So I, I just want to let you know, I've had some great Puerto Rican food, some great Malaysian food. Oh yeah. These are all important ingredients into creating the vibrant culture that attracts innovators to our community. So thank you. And I saw the link is in the, in the chat. Uh, John, Absolutely. Jordan, Jordan Walbesser from Boot. Well, a bunch of things, but you're, we're featuring Boot Sector today. That, that's you. right. That's right. I wear a, a lot of different hats. Um, today, I'm here on uh, on behalf of Boot Sector. I'm the vice president over there. Uh, I wanted to introduce Boot Sector to many of you who haven't heard of us. Uh, we are a 501c3 whose mission is to empower, educate, and support the next generation of local entrepreneurs and startup leaders. Uh, we serve three groups. We serve founders, we serve community organizers, and we serve donors. Um, I'm going to send a link in the chat, keep this nice, short, and sweet, uh, but some of the things that we do specifically for community organizers is power events like this one here. So um, we are very proud to be powering Rock Growth. Uh, we have provided uh, some of the background technical support, the Zoom link, um, and, and you know we do this for a number of different groups and events in Rochester, Buffalo, and the rest of Western New York. So. Uh, I'll send my information into the chat if you're interested, if you're organizing a community event and you need some back end support or some donation support, uh, let us know. We'd love to talk. Thank you. Um, so many of the great entrepreneurs, our pals down the throughway in Buffalo are behind this and we all look each other. We, we're all siblings. So um, thank you for your support here in Rochester and we're here to support you in whatever we, the way we can in Buffalo. So Adam Eaton, my friend Adam. Hello. Yeah, all right, there you are. Hi, I'm Adam Eaton, local artist and director of Rochester Artists Collaborative. My art focuses on the beauty of the people in our community. And my arts organization um, focuses on artists as small business owners because artists are essential to Rochester's economic growth and development and will be crucial for uh, Rochester's recovery post-pandemic. Unfortunately, because of Rochester's history of racism and discrimination, many Black artists are not able to afford the resources they need. So Rochester Artists Collaborative mission is to fix that problem. And we need the help of the community to provide scholarships to these low-income artists to use our new Creators Lab Studio, which provides artists the space, equipment, and education they need to be successful artists thank you and adam you 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 are the prototype of someone who pays it forward and gives first without expectation so thank you, thank you. all right we have nine minutes left we're going to end at one sharp um so let's return to paul and simeon and i'll open it to you guys how can we help we have uh 70 or so people on this call. What can we do to support this effort? Paul, do you want to tell them how to sign the pledge? Yeah, absolutely. So if you go to the website, um, the northstarrock.com, um, uh, if you go um, under the uh, partners page, um, and uh, I, I, I put a link in, into the chat, um, you can sign the pledge um, directly on, on that page or on the on the on the um, navigation bar at the top, it, there's also a link to signing the pledge there, um, and just stay on our on our email list. You can check out all the information there. Um, you can submit a request if there's anything um, coming in through the the 
federal funds that you have questions about or um, any of the materials that you have questions about. I know that we're also going to be sharing information as the city and the county and the school district um, start to allocate these funds and, and their different um, webinars that they're going to have or, or public forums where they're going to discuss um, how these funds should be spent. Um, we, we publicize those, but we obviously encourage everyone to be involved in this process. Um, I think something else um, that Simeon didn't mention um, that, that, I, that I think we should note is um, part of what we're working on also is tracking where these, where these funds are going. Um, I think that's a really important part. Um, typically when this comes into our community or anywhere, um, we hear about all these, this splash of like all these dollars that are coming in, but where's the, but there, there isn't often the same amount of uh, follow-up and, and lessons learned as to what, what we did well, what can we do better? How can, how can the community um, advise as to how these funds should be spent? Um, th this isn't something that uh, is, is gonna be handled by Simeon and Paul and a couple of other people. This is really a community-wide uh, effort to make sure that not only we receive the funds and that they're distributed equitably, but that there's some follow through um, and, and we can track where that's going. Um, so I think that's a, yeah. So I don't know if you wanna add anything to that, Simeon. Well, Richard, I would just say that you remember a few minutes ago when you were trying to kind of find Paul and pin him to the screen, I've been doing the same thing to pin him back to Rochester. <laughs> That's exactly, and you guys can hear why uh, we were so grateful to, uh, to have him join us. Uh, on this project um, is because that's what we've got to do is we've got to keep the talent here. Um, we've got to, you know, all the folks that you just heard announcements from um, the innovative energy that's happening. It is happening here in Rochester. And a big part of this question is how do we ensure that we keep it here? How do we continue to grow it? And how do we make sure it's equitable? I want to point out that this initiative is not just city-based. It's the economic region, the nine counties that is often called the Finger Lakes Regional Economic Development. Um, well, it's covered by the council. So um, I, I also, you know, yeah, I, I just want to underscore the, the regional aspect. Um, when the Boston Consulting Group was retained to do their report several years ago that led to Rock 2025, they, they underscored the importance of downtown and, and, and the relationship the outer rate region has to the city itself. And um, I want you to respond to this quote that appears on the website in it, right there, I think on the homepage, the Urban Institute studied the relationship between economic health and policies for racial and economic inclusion. There is a strong correlation. 270 feet, cities they studied, Rochester was ranked 241. So I think we should, before we wrap up, I wanna again discuss briefly how all these pieces fit together that even Genesee County, Livingston County, Ontario, certainly, they're, we're all entwined. Um, so um, I was, uh, I saw uh, a little earlier as I was kind of thumbing through uh, who else has uh, joined us today, uh, my good buddy uh, and partner in good, uh, Jen Cathy. Um, and uh, she and I were, uh, along with a group of other philanthropic partners, were meeting every single day at the outset of the pandemic um, as we were working together to distribute um, funds for organizations um, through the Community Crisis Fund. And at the outset of that process, we knew that we needed to be thoughtful about crisis, but we also needed to plan for recovery. Now take a step back. As we started to think about recovery, initially it was kind of, you know, the stuff that you might normally think of, um, you know, stabilizing organizations. And we know that that's an important activity, but then we came across this study. And as I was reading the study from Urban Institute that you referenced, um, I read the study and said, I gotta call these people and figure out why and what inclusive recovery, that was the title of that study. Uh, what are they talking about specifically? And so we got on the phone with um, uh, Tina Stacy and the team that put that report together. And I said, geez, you know, do you guys have some more data evidence that helps to demonstrate um, this argument uh, about how there's, a there's an opportunity to do really smart economic work by connecting it to equity? And they did. And that partnership then versioned into what you now know as the North Star Coalition. Richard, I think about it this way, right? If you think of a place like say Birmingham, Alabama, 
right? Uh, Birmingham, Alabama is not exactly uh, the uh, cultural mecca, right? It wasn't a, a sprawling metropolis, um, but Birmingham is enjoying this resurgence. It's really fascinating because it's a function, I think, of convergence. On one hand, you've got all of the activity of the civil rights movement that we know about, right? And all the wonderful uh, and fascinating things that happen there. At the same time, there's a community that reoriented itself um, to embrace the changes in our economy, become a knowledge-based economy. And in many ways, people describe Birmingham as the Boston of the South, right? They are in many ways, a icon of the new South. The way I figure it is, at some point, we get to knock the rust off the rust belt. At some point, there are going to be cities that are the exemplars for this area that had been neglected, that had been left behind in a lot of ways by our economy to rejoin and to step to the forefront um, of our nation's economy. Folks got to remember, we were Silicon Valley before Silicon Valley. Xerox and Kodak and Bausch, these were the high tech companies of their day. And so there is no reason why we can't reclaim our position and our role if we look for that convergence. Let's find the equity opportunities and let's connect those with innovation. In fact, I would argue that the innovation that we need to embrace is equity. And that in so doing, we set ourselves up for a more prosperous future. Right on. And this ties into your recognition and appreciation of how long-term the Community Foundation approaches things with their forever funds. This isn't something that is going to change overnight. But with the investment, the South 50 years ago was economically destitute, was um, totally riven with racism. And now where do young people want to live? Charlotte, Atlanta, Nashville, Birmingham. And um, anyway, I think we have a bright future ahead of us. I, I await your induction in October. I know it's, a, it's, it's brilliant that you all are, are doing a one-year transition. Um, maybe we will get Paul back, but if not, I'm glad you, you remain connected in Rochester. So thank you all. Um, and I also wanna thank out my team, our team. The Rock Road team includes Josh Krager, the, the force behind the Rochester Open Coffee Club, Mike Thaney, our, our local um, startup grind chapter leader, um, Chris Cooley, who, who delivered the opening remarks, and of course, Tom Myers behind the scene who, who makes all of this sort of this stuff work. Um, I don't believe I've omitted anyone. Um, hopefully, uh, all of you will feel engaged, share it. We will be po um, posting the recording probably sometime within the next 24 hours on our website, push out an email, please share. It's also on podcast format. It's on all the major platforms. And um, we want to hear from you at info at Rock Growth. And let us know, particularly, um, we're, we're wondering the, the um, appetite for an in-person event. And we'd love to resume that perhaps when the weather warms up back in, in May or June, we have several ideas. So please stay tuned, um, spread the word about Rock Growth and um, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.